Behind me is a very special class of equations in number theory. It is called a linear Diophantine equation. And the name kind of speaks for itself. Basically, there's a linear combination and it's a Diophantine equation in which we are only interested in integer solutions. So basically, we want to find a pair of integers, x and y, such that this equation is satisfied. Now you might be thinking, why don't we just plug in values for x and then solve for y? The thing is that the most of the times, you will not be finding an integer solution for y, because when you divide by 5,967, chances are you won't be getting an integer. And you might try other techniques such as modular arithmetic, but that can be kind of hard because of the large coefficients that are present here. So we might want to divert to some sort of other solution. And this solution, this method that I'm about to show you, is a very elegant and common technique in solving tough equations like this one. Yes, you heard me right, it's both elegant and pretty common. So to do this, to solve this, I will actually divide the board into two halves, okay? Firstly, I want to go over something about linear Diophantine equations. If we have a linear Diophantine equation, ax plus by is equal to c, where a, b, and c are known integers, then there exists, there exists an integer solution for x and y, if and only if the greatest common factor of a and b fully divides c. As I said, this notation means c is divisible by gcd of a and b. So for this equation to even have a solution for x and y, we must have that the greatest common factor of 4,823 and 5,967 will successfully divide 13. So our goal to start off is to first compute the greatest common factor of 4,823 and 5,967, just to see if there even is a solution. Note that henceforth, I'm just going to denote the greatest common factor of two numbers with the brackets and an ordered pair. I'm not going to always write GCD because that can be kind of tiring. So just know that, just know that the brackets and an ordered pair will denote the greatest common factor. And this is actually quite common. <laughs> so we want to compute the greatest common factor, but it's not really easy to find the factorization for these two numbers. If you are familiar with finding greatest common factors, a common technique is to break it down and then to find what factors they have in common, and then you get the greatest common factor that way. But it's not very easy to factorize when the prime factors are so arbitrary, right? So arbitrarily large as well. So we might want to think of another method. Sure, you could maybe suspect that there is a solution and therefore 13 would be a factor of both. You can suspect that and try 13 on both of these numbers and you will see that it works. But is that the greatest common factor? So we need another algorithm to help us get the greatest common factor. Well, there is, and it's called the Euclidean algorithm. It states that the greatest common factor of m n, if m is greater than n, this is also equal to the greatest common factor of m minus n and n. This is the Euclidean algorithm. So try to think of why this is true, first of all. But secondly, you can see that this is much more easier than factorizing. So I'm actually going to write this on the top of the board just so that we don't take up space. So let's use the Euclidean algorithm to compute this. Firstly, observe that the number 5,967 this is equal to 4,823 times 1, and then plus 1,144. So by the Euclidean algorithm, we can say that the greatest common factor between these two numbers is also equal to the greatest common factor of 4,823 and 1,144, because we just subtract 5,967 by 4,823 and we subtract that one time, right? So now that we have this, we can simplify this even further with the Euclidean algorithm again. So observe that 4,823, so 4,823, this is equal to 1,144 and then times four and then plus 247. Now notice that over here, this would mean that from here, from this stage, we can subtract 4,823 
by 1144 four times until we get 247 so something less than 1144 so if we subtract this you know four times of this then we get four not four 247 and 1144's greatest common factor by the Euclidean algorithm again. So now that we have this, again, we can simplify. Take the larger of the two numbers, 1144. This is equal to 247, and then times 4, and then plus 156, meaning that we can subtract 1144 four times to get something smaller than 247, right? So by the Euclidean algorithm, this greatest common factor is also equal to the greatest common factor between 247 and 156. And now we can just repeat the process over and over again. Notice that the idea is that we can take the larger of the two numbers, in this case 247, and we can write it as 156 times 1, which is the quotient if you were to, def if you were to divide 247 by 156, and then we plus the remainder, right? And basically, by the Euclidean algorithm, we may subtract the larger of the two numbers, so 247. We may subtract this one times of 156, and this would result in the greatest common factor of 91 and 156. The key is that you just want to bring this larger number down until it's smaller than the originally smaller number. So in this case, 91 is also smaller than 156. And we've been using this throughout the entire process. So I'm just going to skip the entire process because hopefully you've taken your time to actually understand it rather than just me writing th this down over and over again and, you know, not comprehending what I'm doing. So skipping to it. Okay, so I've repeated the process as you can see. And I've also made our writing a little bit more compact. I've also numbered our stages because I'm going to have to refer to them later. So I eventually got the greatest common factor between 0 and 13. And since 0 is divisible by any integer, then this over here is just equal to 13. And therefore, this is equal to 13. And 13 clearly divides this 13 over here. So there exists such a solution that we want to find. Now, as I said, we want to find that solution. We don't just want to prove that such a solution exists. So how do we explicitly find that solution? <laughs> well, the key is that we can work this entire process backwards. Now, you might be wondering, how do we do that? I mean, this is such a mess. How do we work this backwards? <laughs> well, the, the thing is that we can observe that from stage 7, we can move 26 times 2 onto the other side. So this would give us that 13 is equal to 65 minus 26 times 2. Right? Now, observe this. If we were dealing with the Diophantine equation, 65x plus 26y is equal to 13. If we were trying to solve this equation, then notice that from here, we would have already solved it. And that's because well, we would have gotten one particular solution at least. And the reason is, that this equation is telling us that x is equal to 1 and y is equal to negative 2 is such a solution. Now, we don't want to solve this solution. We don't want to solve this equation. We want to solve this equation. So how can we build off of this to obtain this? Well, the key is that we can actually write this 65 and 26 in terms of larger numbers. Now, check this out. <laughs> From stage 6, we can move 65 times 1 onto the other side giving us that 26 is equal to 91 minus 65. And we can substitute this 26 over with 91 minus 65. So this would be 65 minus 91 minus 65, and then times 2. And observe that from stage 5, we can move 91 over onto the other side, giving us that 65 is equal to 156 minus 91. So we can replace this 65 with... 156 minus 91. And we can distribute the 2 into the brackets as well as this negative sign. So we get minus 2 times 91 and then plus 2 times 65. Now observe this. Once again, we have a 65. So we can replace 65 with 156 minus 91. So that's 156 and then minus 2 times 91 right after distributing the 2. 
notice that we can treat the 156s as a common term or a common variable. And over here, this would be 1 times 156 and then plus 2 times 156. Well, we can add the coefficients, the coefficients, and we would get that we have 3 times 156, right? And it's the same story for the 91s. Negative 91 minus 2, that's negative 3 times 91, and then minus 2 again, that would be negative 5 times 91. So that's minus 5 times 91. And notice this once again. If we were dealing with the Diophantine equation, 156x plus 91y is equal to 13, if we, if we were solving this, then we would have already gotten a solution because this is telling us, or this is telling us that x is equal to 3 and y is equal to negative 5 is such a solution. Now, once again, we don't want to solve this, but we can build off of this, or this expression, to help us eventually arrive at this equation. Now, this is how we do it. Observe that once again, from stage, from stage 4, we can rearrange for 91. 91 is equal to 247 minus 156. So this 91 over here, as we said, it's equal to 247 minus 156 from stage 4, right? Now, also, this 156 over here from stage 3, we can write it as 1,144 1, 1, minus 4 times 247. So this 156 can be written as... Now, notice that once again, this one, 156 can be written from stage 3 as... <laughs> as... 1,144 and then minus 4 times 247. <laughs> now, notice that once again, if we were to distribute the numbers into the brackets, so this is 3 times, so I'm going to distribute it in, so this is 3 times 1,144 and then minus 12 times 247, right? And over here we have minus 5 times 247, and then over here we can distribute the 5 in, giving us that this is 5 times 1,144, and then minus 20 times 247, right? Now, notice that, again, it's the same story as over here. We can treat the 1,144s as a common variable. And over here, this is 3 times 1,144, and then plus 5 times of it. So in total, that would be 8 times 1,144, and then, over here, for the 247s, we can also treat them as a common variable. So, negative 12 minus 5, that's negative 17. And then negative 7, so yeah, negative 17 and then minus 20. Well, that would be negative 37. So this would give us negative 37 times 247. Okay, so I've cleared up a bit of space up here because I really do not want to continue writing downwards. So, Observe that over here, we can replace these two numbers in terms of even larger numbers. So, from stage 2, we may rewrite 247 as 4,823 minus 4 times 1,144. So, we can make that substitution over here. And, notice that this 1,144, well, from stage 1, it can be written as 5,967 minus 4,823. So we can rewrite this. And this 37, or this negative 37, we can distribute that in. So that, so that would be minus 37 times 4,823. Sorry that I might be blocking the view. <laughs> and then this negative 37 times negative 4, that is plus 148 times 1,144. Now, notice that this 1,144 from stage 1 can also likewise be replaced by, you know, just moving this over. So this would be, and there we have it. Now, we may distribute this 148 into the brackets, and we can also distribute this 8 into the brackets as well. Doing that would give us, now that I've distributed the 8 and 148, as you can see, we can now do the same thing that we've been doing all along. Notice that we can treat the, the large numbers as some sort of common variable. So this 5,967, this one over here as well, they are a common variable. And they have coefficients of 8 and 148. When we add them, well, add the coefficients, that's 156 times 5,967, right? And likewise, for the 4,823s, 
there's a minus 8 and then minus 37 so that would be minus 45 and then minus 148 well that would be minus 193 times 4823 and finally there we have it from just from over here we were able to build off of this and eventually get that 13 is equal to this entire expression Re remember all of our expressions have consistently been equal to 13 so this is equal to 13 and comparing this with this equation we can see that y is equal to 156 because 156 is multiplied with 5967 like this one over here and x over here can be equal to negative 193 and this is one such solution that we have found throughout the solution i felt like it would have been very wordy and very hard to understand if it weren't for someone to narrate through the steps in this case i'm going to do a brief summary the basic idea was that we use the Euclidean algorithm to compute the greatest common factor of the two coefficients. And to do that, well, we just take we just take the larger of the two numbers, right? So this one, for example, and then we write it as a quotient plus remainder form. And we were able to reduce the numbers in the brackets until we got something manageable. And therefore, we were able to check if there was such a solution, right? Because 13 divides 13 in this case. And... Furthermore, the way that we found the solution, explicitly found the solution, was to work this entire algorithm backwards. Notice that we were able to rearrange for the remainders, right? We were, at each stage, we were able to move this part, the, the quotient times, you know, quotient part over onto the other side. And we were able to rearrange for the remainders, right? And in doing so, we were able to rewrite these smaller remainders, so like, 26 and 65, we were able to rewrite them in terms of 91s and 156s. And we were able to do that over and over again until we got our coefficients that we wanted, right? And notice that the idea is that if we had larger numbers, we could do the substitution even more and we could get larger coefficients. So if you had some sort of larger coefficient equation, that would not be a trouble aside from calculation time. <laughs> So yeah, that's the basic idea of this method. I really hope you understood it, and I really hope you found it interesting. If you did, please do consider dropping a like and subscribing. Thank you very much. Bye!